Well, welcome back, everyone, to our Revelation small group series uh, titled Unveil. We're so glad that you have uh, stuck with us through all nine lessons. In fact, I just want to congratulate you and thank you for uh, being with the church's small group ministry and a special thanks to your hosts for opening up their home or uh, maybe their place of business. I know that we have uh, virtual groups going on as well. And so hopefully as a result of going through uh, these churches and the, the first part of the book of Revelation, um, you have received uh, some hope um, and some encouragement from God's word. This book, as I mentioned from the very first lesson, it's probably the most misunderstood book of the Bible. Uh, but the mysteries that God reveals here in these 22 chapters, particularly in these letters to the churches in the region of Asia Minor are significant. Um, they were important then, and they remain to be essential to us now. And so we've come as far as the last church, the church of Laodicea. And uh, there's a few opening remarks I'd like to make. Um, first things first, I, I just wanna say that, you know, when you think of the church of Laodicea, uh, what comes to mind uh, is this present age that we're in right now for church uh, as we know it in America and around the world. And I think that uh, the state of the church of Laodicea in the book of Revelation uh, really is a, a telltale sign of the condition somewhat of the universal church um, around the globe. And I want us to keep that in mind as we go forward. Also, when I think of the church of Laodicea, I'm reminded of the fact that you will never hear of a church called uh, the church of Laodicea. Like I've heard of uh, churches calling themselves the church of Philadelphia. I've heard of uh, different ministries and churches like the Berean ministry yeah, or the Colossi ministry, or even the Ephesus church uh, having Sunday school classes named after it or ministries and missions named after it. But you will never hear a Christian organization um, that knows the Bible at least or or a, a church naming a group or a class after Laodicea. It just doesn't happen. And the reason why that is is because, you know, when you study the Bible, you see that people have made God angry, particularly you see that in the Old Testament. We know that our actions can grieve God. But did you know that uh, we could live our life in such a way that we can make God literally sick? And that is how we categorize the Church of Laodicea. Uh, they really didn't have anything good to report. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that through a series of events uh, that have transpired in the church and the choices that they made, um, they made the Lord sick. And they are the last letter, I believe, on purpose. And so. Uh, we're going to look at what Christ has to say to this church um, and ultimately what we can learn from it. Um, I believe God has left this here so that we could not just gain knowledge because knowledge without learning something really is, is just a waste. Uh, God wants us to see what the message to the Laodicean believers were and to without question apply it to our lives. And so Let's start by uh, looking at verse 14 of chapter three here, this last church, and it says, and to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, and we're gonna get the message now that Christ wants to give to this church. And, you know, I wouldn't wanna be here to get this letter, uh, but this is the church of Laodicea. And there's a few important background pieces of information I wanna share with you that I think we'll see come into play when Christ gives the counsel for this church as we begin. Uh, first of all, this is, as we mentioned, the last of the seven churches to receive a letter. Um, and you'll notice these um, in your notes and on the screen. Uh, this church also represents, as we mentioned, kind of a, a larger picture of the universal church in our history right now. Um, this church also was living at a time in history where their city was enjoying something called the Pax Romana, which was basically peace under Romans rule. And that in turn contributed to a considerable amount of financial prosperity, as we know, because the city uh, was wealthy and it was wealthy because it produced uh, a black wool fabric that was desired um, everywhere. And so uh, they enjoyed the, the commerce that came with that. Also, interestingly enough, and again, this will come into play on the back end of the letter, in addition to the wool, in addition to them being financially strong, 
They also were a place where people traveled travel to to get what was known as an eye ointment. Um, there was a medical school that produced this eye ointment, and it became something that was known everywhere. And so people traveled to get it. And that brought in a certain amount of finances. And so Laodicea was cashed up, as the saying goes. Uh, they were, when you look at all of the cities, they were probably the, the most financially stable city. And as a result, because the church was located there, the church itself uh, was was people who prospered, people who had a certain amount of affluence to them. And you could begin to see why perhaps this church is considered to be the lukewarm church. And so just keep those things in mind as we go through the church of Laodicea here at the beginning. Now, we know that they were located about a hundred, approximately 100 miles east of Ephesus, making them the, the most, um, you know, southern part of uh, these seven letters, these seven churches here. Uh, it was most likely founded during Paul's uh, ministry visit to Ephesus, and we've been saying that with a number of these churches, Acts chapter 19, verse 10. Um, and again, this church uh, has the label of being lukewarm, and we'll explain what that means, of making Christ sick. And so uh, that's the background of this church, the history of this church, if you will. Now Jesus, as he has done in each of these letters, he gives a description for himself, And this is what it says in the second part of verse 14. The words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. Now that is a beautiful description of Christ. And let's start here with the amen, uh, which means I agree and true and faithful. And what it's communicating here is Jesus is the confirmation of God's holy word. He is the word revealed to us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And it's important for us to have that distinction. I believe it was important for the Laodiceans to get this because he alone has the right to bring whatever words of judgment and correction that are about to come to any of the churches, especially the lukewarm Laodiceans. And so this also speaks of the fact of that he is confirming um, every bit of what he said for himself to be. Um, You know, in John chapter 14, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so uh, that's what that statement means, am, the faithful, true witness. The second part here is he's the beginning of God's creation, and that signifies that Jesus is the source of creation. Now, it's not saying that God created him first. Don't get confused. Christ always existed. Uh, John 1.3, Colossians 1.16, and Hebrews 1.12. So uh, we want to understand and frame the supremacy of Christ that way. Um, What it is, again, representing is, is that he is the source of creation. It's a reminder of James, uh, you know, chapter one, where it says, every good and perfect gift comes from above. Christ is the source. Everything that's created, we must understand that. And that helps us to build our really our theological understanding of the supremacy and the sovereignty of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's it. That's that's the beginning part here of how Christ describes himself. Now, let's get into what are, without question, the concerns that Christ had. And I, and I use that word because these, these are concerns that Jesus has not only for this church, but any church that might be in danger of being like the Laodiceans. And so here are the concerns for this particular church. And you might want to jot uh, this first one down. Uh, Laodicea was a compromising church. Now, this is similar to the church of, of Pergamos, as we know, but really any church that is allowing themselves to choose between good and evil, between being committed to the word of God and being committed to the flesh. However you want to describe it, somewhere along the line, the church of Laodicea allowed perhaps their pursuit of prosperity to get in their way of their pursuit of Almighty God. You know, long before we had the prosperity gospel as we know it today in our modern church culture, 
perhaps the church of Laodicea was where it began, where people lusted after money so much and they equated their spiritual moxie, their, their spiritual bravado, their spiritual eliteness to having things and possessions. Maybe that was where their compromise lied in addition to sinful pursuits. Nevertheless, we know that Christ knows their works. Let's take a look at the verse now. In chapter three, verses 15 and 16, Jesus says, I know your works. Now you might wanna circle that entire phrase. That is a familiar phrase with these letters. And it speaks of the omniscience of Christ, the all-knowing eyes, heart, and ears of the Lord Jesus Christ, his perfect mind. I know your works. In other words, I know your labor. I know your service. I know how you're conducting business. You know, that word works, uh, that really is kind of just a synonym for the church's dealings, how the church operates, its ministry. I know your works. I know your ministry. And this is what he says about it. Listen, this is very damning, okay? Listen to what it says here. You are neither cold nor hot, okay? Now, what does it mean to be a hot Christian, okay? To be a hot Christian means that you're on fire for God. You have a you have a zeal, but it's it's a sincere zeal. And I believe that terminology being hot, you know, when Jesus is talking about hot and cold, it means somebody who's not stepping on people or bashing people over there with the Bible, but that they, they have a burning passion for God. That's a good thing. You want to be hot in your relationship with God. What does it mean to be cold? I think it could mean two things. I think first it could mean somebody who's apathetic. They're a believer, but they're apathetic. Eh, they, you know, they kind of just go through the motions with church. And they're not a bad person, you know, they're, 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 they have an obligation, they fulfill it. You know, they're not a disingenuous person, you know, they, they might even be transparent at times, but they're apathetic. You know, it's hard to get them to, to pray. It's hard to get them to be committed to other things outside what their obligation might be. And this might be sometimes uh, the case for people who are legalistic or kind of get caught up in the liturgy or the religion of a church. Um, you know, the movements that way, that's very possible. People could be, they could get cold and, you know, that's a way to look at it. They could be apathetic, but it could also mean something very severe. Somebody who's unredeemed, somebody who has willfully chosen to reject Christ. So I think it could be a dual meeting. Nevertheless, Jesus says, you're neither cold nor hot. You're neither apathetic or you're passionate, okay? Um, you, you know, either you're, you, you're just, you're, you're nothing, okay? You're neither cold nor hot. But he's going to tell us that they're lukewarm. He says, now, with that you were either cold or hot, verse 16. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now, when you spit something out of your mouth, why do you do that? Because it tastes disgusting, right? You know, Raising two boys, you know, you introduce, you try to introduce food to them other than pizza and chicken nuggets and, and chocolate chip cookies, okay? There are other foods out there, we told them. And every once in a while, you slip a vegetable in there or some other type of green or, or my green drink I give them. And, and, you know, Ben is a little bit more daring with, with, you know, trying to try things because he's younger. Joseph used to do the same thing, but, but now he's too cool for that. But Whenever they taste something they don't like, they spit it out. And Ben is very demonstrative with how he kind of shows his emotions. And, and he'll be like, oh my goodness, this is disgusting, he'll say. And he'll, he'll say, I got to take a shower. You got to take a shower to get the taste out of his mouth. And, you know, when Jesus was sampling the church of Laodicea, if you will, they were disgusting to him. And they were neither cold nor hot. They were lukewarm. Now that's phrase lukewarm. That's an interesting word there. It's the only time we get it in the Bible. Now, why is Jesus saying they are lukewarm? He could have used any statement there. Why is he saying this? Well, you got to understand Laodicea, the city of Laodicea. Understand their water filtrate system. Uh, they had water um, outside the city uh, through the aqueducts that came in that it started out hot. It came out of the spring, it was hot. And as it was brought into the city, and the, again, their filtration system, as it was brought into the city, um, by the time it went from where it came out into the actual places where I guess people drew from it, 
it was no longer hot. It was lukewarm. They also had the same problem with their cold water um, as well. It was the opposite uh, effect as it was coming in from Colossae. It was piped in that way. Um, By the time it reached, it was what? Lukewarm. And so Jesus, by saying this, they would know exactly what he was talking about because they had that issue with their water, both the hot and the cold. It started out hot, it started out, it started out cold, but eventually it was lukewarm. And obviously people didn't like that. And so they, they actually um, had measures for how they would temper the water. And Jesus is saying right here is that lukewarm, uh, this is disgusting. The same way that you're sipping lukewarm water when you need it to be cold or hot for whatever reason, You know, I need you to be hot and you're not. You're not even cold. You're just lukewarm, which is disgusting to me. It's useless to me because at least if you were, you know, if you were kind of uh, apathetic, uh, there's things I could do to discipline you or to get you to be in a place where you would be hot. Or if you're unredeemed, obviously my love is on you and I'm not willing for any to, to fall away, to perish, but you're just neither. And it really just speaks of the disgust that Jesus has. And again, how do you get to a place of being lukewarm? You compromise. And this has been a theme again in several of these churches. And it's not just these churches, it's in every church. And it's in me and it's in you. We can fall into the dangers of compromising. Next, notice that Laodicea was a conceited church. They were a conceited church. Now, why were they conceited? Well, what do we say from the top? Financially, they were doing great. The wool industry, the finance industry, and again, that eye ointment that everybody was coming to grab and get. But they were chasing the wrong prosperity. They needed the riches of Christ. Listen to what Jesus says in Revelation 3.17. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are a wretched pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Whoa. Again, that's what, remember what I said at the top of this message um, with this church, you wouldn't want to be there when Jesus gave this letter. Um, You could say that the Lord's not happy with them. Well, why is that? You know, perhaps the ugliest of all sins is what? Pride. And really at the heart of all of our sinful pursuits, is pride. We walk away from God. We walk away from church. We walk away from people. We walk away from purpose because of pride. Pride truly cometh before the fall. And one of the most dangerous areas of pride is when it pertains to possessions and finances. And this church is wrapped up in all of that. And the fact that they have this attitude that they have everything, you know, What we must realize is, is as we've said before in church in previous messages, the Bible's very clear. God is far more concerned about your heart and your growth prospering, not your pocketbook or your wallet. Now, yes, the Lord knows that we have needs, but he's also promised to supply for our needs according to his riches. We don't ever want to get to a place when we start to fall in love or in, or in lust with our own ability to make wealth or to make good for the needs that we have, to put food on the table for our family or to keep the lights on, that's a dangerous place to be. Let us remember that it is God who provides. And in his graciousness, he gives us the ability to work, to earn a living. He gives us the very breath in our lungs. He gives us the beat that's going on right now in our heart. He gives us the energy to even have this lesson right now. Um, And somewhere along the line, the Laodiceans went to a dangerous place, the dangerous place of conceit. And you don't want to get there. And so then what's the counsel for the Laodiceans? How could we learn from this church um, for what the Lord's going to say to them? I I think there there are three lessons here. Um, You might want to jot this first one down. Uh, Laodicea needed the true riches of Christ. And that's what Jesus is going to tell them here. Look at verse 18. They needed the true riches of Christ. Jesus said, I counsel you, okay, so this is the counsel. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich. Now, what does that mean? 
Is Jesus walking around like with a long trench coat and he opens one side and has something here for them to buy? No. Pure gold that's refined by fire is a reference to the fact that something has had its impurities taken out. And so Jesus is saying that there are true riches that you could grab onto, that you can hold onto, that I could offer to you. Secondly, Laodicea needed the covering of Christ. There was a specific covering that Jesus could provide. Notice what it says here, and white garments so that you may clothe yourselves and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. I mean, look at the graciousness of Jesus here. Obviously, he could have just blew them away with the evil uh, that they were doing, the compromise that they were giving into the conceit, but he doesn't do that. He wants to cover them. And the white garments is, is also symbolic, as we study Revelation, of character. Um, it, it's, it speaks of the character of Christ that he wants them to put on. You know, in the book of Ephesians, we thought we hear about Paul teaching the church at Ephesus about what you got to put on in Christ. You know, put this off and put this on. And that's essentially what Jesus is saying here. And it's a reminder of how God covered Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. You know, God is always in the business of covering our sins, but not just with a religious sacrament or just you and I going through religious motions, but our sins are covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's a beautiful picture here that the Laodiceans needed that. And as we, we look very clearly at this particular church, we see that they uh, many times um, drew this encouragement from the Lord Jesus Christ about counsel. But it's, again, a reminder of the core truths of the gospel, which are that Jesus Christ died for our sins and he rose from the dead. And the church of Laodicea needed to hear this. And as you study the book of Revelation in its totality, um, it always comes back to this message, this message of covering, that God indeed is good, that God indeed is a loving God, not willing for any to perish, but for all to reach repentance. And such was the case for the believers in Laodicea. The last principle here that you want to write down for the council portion is this. Laodicea needed the healing touch of Christ for their eyes. Now, you might recall at the top, we told you that this was a place that was famous for eye ointment. And listen to what Jesus says here in Revelation 3.18, the last part of it. And Sava to anoint your eyes so that you may see. And so Sava was, again, an ointment that was put on the eye to help heal the eye. And Jesus says, I know you got your own ointment for eye disease. I know you got your own wealth to take care of yourself. I know you have enough wool to make your own covering for your own garments, but you need my true riches you need my wool to cover you and you need my healing touch so that you could be healed of your spiritual blindness that you have. You know, for the unredeemed people, they had a complete blindness. They were in the dark. And perhaps for the believers that were there that were apathetic, they had a cataract, if you will. They, they saw very foggy uh, the things of God. And so God was offering this through his son, Jesus Christ. This was the counsel for the church. You got to buy from me. Oh, I got the true riches that you need. I have the covering that you need. And I am the one who could touch you in such a way so that you could see spiritually. And so that's the counsel for the church. But now let's, uh, let's close here with the compassion and now the comforting promise for Laodicea. First, look at the compassion for Laodicea. Um, as I just mentioned, you know, Jesus could have easily obliterated this church. I mean, they made him sick, didn't they? But you see the heart of the Lord. You see the compassion of the Lord. Look what it says here in Revelation 3, 19 through 20. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. How about that word throughout these letters where these churches needed to change? The constant call to repent. Verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, Jesus says. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door... I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. What a promise that Jesus is giving here. But it also shows first his compassion in two ways. First, Jesus is offering salvation to those who are unredeemed. 
There are people here in Laodicea who they're not just apathetic. We'll get to them in just a minute. These are people who are in the dark, who are unregenerate, who are unsaved. And sometimes in our world today of being religiously, politically correct, we want to just make it out that everybody gets to heaven. And even if they don't know Jesus, no, there's a right and there's a wrong. There's light and there's darkness. There's a heaven and there's hell. And there are people who willfully reject Christ. And the gospel makes very clear what happens if you reject Christ. And so Jesus, again, um, isn't willing for any to go down that road. He wants all of us to reach for repentance. And here it is right here that they're told to repent. He's offering salvation to the unredeemed. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And you can make the argument that the church was filled with a majority of people, though they were believers, but a majority of this church were unredeemed and they needed to come to Christ. And then the second part was he was offering a reproof to those who were unfaithful. There were people in this church who were unfaithful. They were saved, but again, they started chasing the lust of the world, the pleasures and the possessions of this world. And what happens when you do that? You become unfaithful. I see it in the pastorate. I see people, you know, they get saved, they get baptized, they start serving, things are going good, and all of a sudden they start chasing ego. They start chasing pleasure. They start chasing possessions. They start chasing popularity. And what happens? They fall away. They become unfaithful. Let that not be said of you and I. Let's learn from the Laodiceans because God also gives a promise to those who endure, to those who hold on and remain strong. Listen to what it says. To the one who conquers, this is verse 21 and 22, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Verse 22, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Here's a comforting promise here that God promises through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, um, that he has a position for those who choose to be hot, to be on fire, to be passionate for the things of God. My friends, I, I leave you with this thought here. Um, in just a moment, we'll wrap up uh, this session and our small group round here of the, the seven churches of Asia Minor. You know, I remember um, a pastor once told me, he said, don't ever let the Lord become old hat. And what he was saying was, was that basically um, his understanding of that phrase old hat was um, that don't put God on the hook and forget him there because you get new things in your life, a new hat in your life, if you will, a new style and you forget the hat. Don't let the Lord become old hat. That's how he explained it to me. And that stuck with me. You know, you don't want to lose your passion for God, your passion for serving, your passion for giving, your passion for praying. And at times uh, that might waver because of trials, tribulations. We've talked about a lot of persecution, right? In these some of these churches, um, how you get that, how you get that going or to keep it going. You got to keep fanning the flame. You got to be around other people who are passionate. You got to go to a church that's passionate, that teaches right. You got to be in groups like this. That's why I commend you. You got to be seeking God in spirit and in truth. You got to be praying on your own. You got to be talking to God. You want to keep that flame going. And you don't ever want to go into a place of being lukewarm. And if you're there right now, not to worry. Look how compassionate the Lord was to these believers. And he's the same way to you and I. And so once again, I want to thank you for being a part of uh, this round of small groups as we have covered uh, these opening chapters of the book of Revelation. I remind you again that this, again, is not a horror story, the book of Revelation. It's a hope story. And that could be seen very clearly in Jesus' message to the seven churches. He gave us this. He preserved these letters. These are letters to, to these churches. And we have been privileged to be able to read them so that we can learn from them. We don't want to repeat the same mistakes. We want to get stronger. And I guarantee you, every one of these believers that are in heaven right now, when we get there, um, you'll have the opportunity to talk with them perhaps um, but their example has been clearly left for us to grow from, um, 
to rise above and to be faithful in our time and in our generation. Um, and whether the Lord returns in our lifetime or he calls us home, that it may be said of us that we were like the Smyrnians, remember them? They, they, they kept on keeping on regardless of the persecution. Or we were like the Philadelphians, the, you know, the believers there that were faithful to the Lord and both of those churches, they received no bad reports. Um, and we are to emulate them, but really we're to look at all seven churches and we're to see that the Lord has something for us. And so let it be said of us that we are faithful, committed, courageous, and that we are one day going to enjoy the promises that he has given to these churches. And so once again, thank you to all our hosts that opened up their homes. And um, may God bless you as you continue to pursue God, as you continue to grow in your faith. And let us be people who are constantly looking at these letters, learning from them, and pursuing God and being the faithful believers that he's called us to be. May God bless you. And uh, may God bless our church to be the type of church that is hot and on fire for the Lord Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Thank you.